and we'll get started. So welcome today. Thanks for joining Idaho Partners for Good. We know your time is valuable, and so we are going to pack this workshop full of practical information and resources. Um, I think most of you are familiar with Idaho Partners for Good, but for the recording, we'll do it. Um, our mission is to reinvent how people like you, me, give, share our expertise, and do greater good together. Our vision is to develop stronger, healthier, better equipped nonprofits so that they can do more of what they do best. We do that by educating donors to give for more impact, providing nonprofits with education, coaching, mentoring, evaluation, account accountability, and capacity building expertise. We have three core values, which is continual learning, designing with end users, and using entrepreneurial mindsets. The experts we put in front of you are best in class, and we are constantly learning, retooling, and innovating to stay ahead of changing times. One of the reasons we record these so that you can access best in class information. Now on to today's workshop. Uh, Maureen O'Toole in her series, Roles, Responsibilities, and Accountability of Boards. Um, these are delivered in a four-part series in a weekly manner. Last week, she addressed the three work areas of the board, strategy and mission, leadership and resources, and performance. This week, her topic is understanding board governance versus staff operations. Um, oh, I'm not sure if these are the next weeks. Are making board level plans and goals and tools? That, yeah, that's next week. Yep. That's next week? Okay. Today, we'll be exploring who does what and how these roles complement each other, as well as the biggest mistakes boards make when working with staff members. So today's learning objective is to help board members as well as staff understand their respective roles and responsibilities so they collaborate effectively within the organization. For anyone who's new, let me introduce Maureen. Maureen's passion is helping people and organizations use their gifts, talents, goals, and strategies to become the best version of their, themselves. She has 30 years of servant leadership in military service, higher education, elementary education, youth leadership, for-profit and nonprofit organizations, and she moves easily between the business and nonprofit sectors. She's a former Silver Sage Girl Scout CEO, current board member um, and chair, I believe, of the Sunrise Ro Rotary Foundation, and I'm going to turn it over to Maureen for today's session. Thank you. Thank you, Bethany. And Nika, I noticed that you need to leave early, so everything I did today, I turned into simple handouts, and you'll get those as well. And this will be recorded, but I will get through the meat of it in the first 30 minutes. Okay. Okay. Thanks. You're very welcome. Okay. So I'm going to bring this up and this is, this is a really powerful topic. So what I'm, a, what I'm trying to help people understand is there's two different entities that, that make a nonprofit work. And one is the board of directors and one is the staff, which is led by the CEO, which is often called an executive director or general manager or a different title. But those are the two entities that work together to make it happen. They have very respective roles. So I outline what the roles are in there. And as I talk through them, I'll tell you some of the ways people cross that cross that imaginary line there and get into each other's stuff and what happens when you do that. So as, as I go through something, please just let me know what your question is, because I'm actually working with an organization right now that has had a, a confusion about respective roles. So I'm actually in the middle of this right now. So it's like top of mind for me. So, and I'm sure it is for you, you guys too. So each one of those entities, the board, board of directors, or often called board of governance, and then the, the staff has separate roles. And the staff is led by the, the staff leader or the CEO or the, whatever you call the, the staff director. It's usually a CEO or executive director. So I'm going to go through the purpose of this, and then I'm going to put their responsibilities right next to each other so you can see how they support each other. And then there's a couple of places where one has obligations and responsibilities that the other doesn't. So I spell those out for you too. And it's just super helpful. I, I call it stay in your lane, helping boards and staff members to stay in your lane so you don't cause confusion. So, you know, we went through this last week and I, and I always go back to what we've talked about before. And it started with Blossom's presentation about, you know, what is fiduciary responsibility? What are the, the three duties, care, loyalty, and obedience? So I always go back to those because those are really the foundational things. So the board, and I brought this up last week, the board has fiduciary responsibility for the nonprofit. And then and I just bolded that, responsible for managing organizational interest because that's just a big catch-all phrase. 
So they are responsible for overseeing the entire organization, not just little bits of it, the whole thing. And I broke that out last week by calling it the three work areas of the board. So what I'm doing with this one, I'm going to bring those three work areas back up in the task underneath and show you how, how they complement the CEO and staff's role. So, so I, this is just, again, here's their three areas, shape the mission and strategic direction, ensure leadership and resources, monitor and improve performance. And even though this, this, chart here is really focused on the board. The truth of the matter is the executive director, the CEO actually works in those three lanes as well. So that's why I put them up this way and show you how they support each other. They're, they're parallel. So what is the purpose of the CEO? And I, I love the graphics. She's like, super, I'm super woman. I handle all this stuff. So the board is over here in policy making and governance and general oversight on a large scale. And the CEO always has to keep that general governance and the big picture in mind by working in the middle of the day-to-day -day ops. So I oversee the employees, the volunteers, day-to-day -day operations, our finances, the property if we have property, the equipment we have, our marketing, our partnerships. It's really down to that, all those tasks, how do they play out? What do I do? Who do I manage? How do I do it? And the other big role of the CEO, and oh gosh, Liberty is a perfect example. When she was in high school, she saw a problem that needed to be solved. And then she created a vision for how to solve it and then started an organization. And the CEO or the executive director is the person who always keeps in mind, you know, how could we get better? How could we scale this up? So always keeping that in mind. Big one, CEO reports to the board. Did the board only gets to, to manage one person and that's the staff leader, the executive director, or the CEO or whatever it's called, but they get to manage one person, just one. So my neighbor is actually the uh, president of Bishop Kelly High School, and he sums it up in a very simple sentence. They hire, discipline, and fire me, and that's what they do. So overly simplistic, but that's what they do. All right, so this time I'm not going to do Girl Scout things. I'm going to do mom jokes, okay? So <laughs> how did the red, why did Red Lobster stop their matching gift program? What do you think? All right, come on, use your best dad bad dad jokes. What do you think the answer is? They were just being shellfish. <laughs> All right, now we get past the silliness because I'm going to put a couple in there because this is a pretty profound, deep topic. So here's where to start with that big, their one big focus, strategic mission, direction, and mission. So what I did is I put the parallel construction of who owns what. So if you're on the board, you go back and you evaluate on a regular basis, is our mission still relevant? Because the board of directors operates according to the board bylaws and the bylaws specify what the purpose of the organization is. The IRS calls it the purpose, the nonprofit world calls it the mission. But a, a huge goal, task for them is to make sure what we're doing is still relevant and that we're actually doing what we said we were gonna do. So let's say, Nika, if your organization provides services to people, or you provide education and training, the board's responsibility there is to make sure, number one, you're doing what you said you were gonna do and you haven't expanded outside your mission. Like you didn't all of a sudden provide homeless shelters for people, that wasn't in your mission. So they're always safeguarding the mission. This is what we said we were gonna do as an organization. And you see on the other side, you get the executive director or the CEO or the president is actually executing the mission. They're actually taking that and turning it into actions. And then when you get to strategic planning, there's fundamental understanding of strategic planning is the best place to do it is actually at the staff level with a lot of guidance and input from the board, because the people who actually execute the plans are the staff. They know what their capability is. They know what their ability is. They know what their capacity is, but that has to be in conjunction with the board. So the board will step back and say, your strategic plan has to do some of these things. It, it might, they might say it has to be two to five years long, or they might say it has to have a vision review, a mission review. It has to have five strategies and work areas. They set the parameters for what that plan looks like. And then any constraints, like a constraint would be, all right, Liberty, this has to be done in the next three months. You need to have a draft, of, a solid draft to us in the next three months. And you have to have a, a budget included with it. They'll tell you what your constraints are and required elements are. And then working with the board, the staff will do the majority of the, the thinking and the heavy lift there of actually 
figuring out what are our, our work areas, what are our strategies and goals in each one of those ones. And then the, on the other side, the next one, working with the staff for the budget planning and long-term planning, you know, make sure that's done in conjunction. You're gonna, finance is not an expertise for me. So I've always managed to have board members who own finance. I, I want you to help me. And I want the, you and the CEO to, to give us some guidance here. Simple guidance might be as simple as, you have to have a three-year budget. You have to have a cash flow statement. You have to operate in the black within the next two years. So you're going to work with the board. What is their guidance for that? And then make sure we're adhering to our values, our mission, and our reputation. Uh, you know, do we have a good reputation in the community? Do we say we do what we say we're going to do? Are we living out our values? So they they're going to own that. Like, what is the our reputation? Are we protecting it? Are we protecting our reputation? So on the other one, make sure whatever you put in the plan adheres to your organizational values. So you just see you see how they parallel each other, but they're slightly different as to who's doing what. And then the bottom one, when you get to the all the bottom, you're you're doing a strategic plan. You set annual plans. You just make sure it's executed and you're tracking it. So you're going to say, all right, Liberty gave us a three to five year plan, and that plan says. We're going to do this in year one, this in year two, this in year three. This is what our budget is going to look like. Here's our community outreach efforts. If you say you're going to do it, it's their job because they own that level of strategic thinking. Are you actually executing your plan and are you executing it well? Because the team's down there in the middle of executing it. Are you guys doing it well? We're going to monitor your performance. And then on the other side of that, as you're implementing, make sure that your team efforts are aligned with the mission, the plans you said you were gonna do, the tactics you said you were gonna do. So both sides of this equation should be looking at their strategies and their tactics on a regular basis. To me, a good, a good rule of thumb is once you have an annual plan or a strategic plan, everybody looks at it at least quarterly and evaluates how we're doing against it. And we make sure our individual team members plans support that. So let's say Bethany's working in a nonprofit. She knows what our mission is. She knows what our vision for good is. She knows what our goals are for the year. And my, my statement of work, my individual efforts support that. They're aligned and they support it. So I just did that quickly. Do you guys have any questions on that? That's just a big picture parallel construction of that. Okay, so I'm a Franklin Covey facilitator and Americans are so uncomfortable with silence that if you wait seven seconds, someone will say something. <laughs> so I waited seven, we're still good, so I'll, I'll move on. All right, here we go. So that was a big picture because you're gonna hear me circle back a little bit. Why did Duracell Company donate batteries for the matching gift program? I know you guys are gonna get this one. They got a charge out of it. <laughs> All right, I'm watching Liberty shake your head. Okay. So when you do that, this once you get the strategic plan in place, you have annual plans. And I always say that a board should have an annual plan as well. Do we know how we're going to organize our talent and our time this year? But once you actually have those big pictures, who are we? What do we do? Where are we going? How are we going to do it? Which is that strategic direction. Then a next big area for the board is that monitor and improve performance. When you're in the middle on the staff side working, working in the business, it's hard to step back and work on the business and evaluate how you're doing. And that's one of the big roles for a board of directors. So when I said at the top, the only staff member that the board actually directs is the CEO. That's the only one. And what happens here is their feedback should go to the CEO. And if they have feedback about individual staff members, it doesn't go from the board to the individual staff member. It goes through the executive director or the CEO. That's the one person that they are responsible for giving feedback and evaluation to. And if you're working on the other side of this, so you're on the staff side and you're the senior leader, ask for feedback and ask for evaluation. Most people want to know how they're doing and they want to know how to get better. That's, that's a big role for the board. Give feedback and give evaluation 
give guidance to the senior director. On the other side of that, if you are the senior director, your responsibility is to take that ability to give feedback and evaluation to the staff itself. You are the one responsible for a regular training, training, job specific training, professional development training. So um, I think it was Bethany was saying you use DISC for professional development for your team. That is the role of the CEO. The CEO is responsible to train people, professional and skill set, to mentor the employees and evaluate performance. If you have a lot of volunteers, you're a volunteer-based organization, there has to be a, a method for you to have two-way conversations so you can communicate with your volunteers about how they're doing and they can communicate with you on, and how the organizational staff is supporting them. But that is the CEO's role right there, train, mentor, and evaluate the staff members and across, and across work areas. So it's interesting to me that some organizations don't have uh, job descriptions. It is very difficult to give performance feedback to a staff member who doesn't have a job description. So part of your role is to make sure that you your staff has job descriptions and they're being evaluated against their job description, that their efforts are focused, you know what the focus is, and you're giving feedback on the focused area. And that those are the two things talked about feedback and evaluation. So then I'll roll over to other things the board is responsible for in terms of monitor and improve performance. Overall organizational effectiveness. Uh, there's some great tools out there like 360 evaluations, but the board wants to step back up here and have the, the big picture view at all times. I wanna look across work areas and typical work areas are gonna be finance, operations, um, customers or clients, marketing, communication, community outreach. How are we doing in those different functional work areas? Evaluate the effectiveness of the plan. So let's say Nika has this really amazing strategic plan that says, here's all the stuff we're gonna tackle this year, when we're gonna tackle it. Make sure you step back and is it being implemented? Is it being implemented effectively? Does everybody on the same page? We know what we're doing and we're doing it well. And the last one is policies. I said last time that by law, the IRS requires all nonprofits to only have two policies. One is the whistleblower policy and the one is document retention and destruction. And it's board's responsibility to step back at least annually and say, do we have the policies in place that we're required to have? Are there other policies we should have? Are we adhering to them? A perfect example is a financial policy. Nika might have a financial policy or Liberty or my organization that says the director can't spend more than $5,000 without board approval. You, you can't just go write big checks if they don't know. So that would be a financial policy. Another policy I've had to deal with working in a very large nonprofit is what if there's an emergency because we had property and we had equipment. If there's an emergency and somebody's injured, the internal communications policy was I contacted the board director immediately. <laughs> Before it hit the news, I contacted the board director and we drafted a statement for the press together. So part of that monitoring performance is do we have are we looking at whole organization? Are we looking at plans to, to have to be effective? I said this last time, make sure where the board is a plan block that various regulations, what are state rules? There's actually over 185 statutes related to nonprofit world. Is somebody on both sides of the equation paying attention to that? And then is the board actually complying with its own bylaws? And this is a big one. And I'm, sure, I'm gonna say this, and a couple of you are probably gonna nod your head or just quietly say, oh yeah, that happens all the time. Board members need to know what their bylaws say and they need to know what the policies say. So when they're in a meeting, somebody says, well, what do the bylaws say? And somebody goes, well, I think they say. Your bylaws are what, how you said you were gonna organize yourself and execute your role as the board. Are we complying to that? And then I always recommend that once a year, the board does a self-assessment tool. And I'm gonna give you a couple examples in two weeks. It, they're simple, they're straightforward. They need to get feedback on themselves. They need to evaluate themselves as well. On the other side of that, monitor and improve performance down at the bottom, we went through the staff, evaluate extra efforts across functional areas, make sure we adhere to board policies, make sure we're operating in accordance with the law. If you deal with children, how long do we have to keep records on children? It could be up to 40 years. Do we know what the laws are in keeping records? And then are we getting feedback? This is a big one, this one's hard. Try to make sure you set time aside every year to get feedback from the people you serve. 
feedback from the board, feedback from the staff, from your partners, your volunteers, and the people you serve. So though that's a lot of work to do, but set aside the time to get feedback. All right, I'm gonna get this through this for Nika. So Nika, I need you, you got nine minutes. We'll move to the next one. Um, so why, why was the cemetery fundraiser so popular? People were dying to get in. <laughs> so here's the, this is the, the biggest area. So last week when I was talking about this part of fiduciary responsibility, this is the biggest area of board work right here. It takes the longest time to, for board members to understand what are my roles in this area. So I started with, to me, probably one of the most important, the care and keeping of the CEO. The CEO is the person who's executing the mission. The CEO is the person who's interfacing with the community, the biggest ambassador in the community. Are you taking care of the senior leader? Because the senior leader's job is to take care of the staff and the volunteers. Is the board taking care of the senior leader? Why does that matter? Because that's who the senior leader reports to, to the board. Um, um, I know uh, Idaho Partners for Good is working on a project just like this now. The board wants to make sure if the senior leader is going to be retiring or transitioning out for personal reasons that there's succession planning. So you wanna know a couple months in advance unless there's an emergency that somebody's leading and you're on top of it. How are we gonna replace them? We, we need to have a succession plan. Is there anybody internally who could do that job or is it gonna be an external hire? And that just takes foresight and long-term thinking. Give yourself a couple months to find the new person. And next one, like my neighbor says, what do they do for me as the CEO, president? Hire, evaluate, discipline, and release me. That's what they do. That's what the board does. But on the other side of this, the senior leader has a lot more people that they're taking care of to ensure leadership and resources. Works for the board. Make sure you're communicating with the board. Hire, train, discipline, release staff and volunteers. That, that's a lot of resource right there. Volunteers are always your biggest resource. Are we taking care of our volunteers? And are we releasing them when they need to be released? Lead and supervise the staff and volunteers to our efforts. And last one, and I know I'm, I'm working with Idaho Partners for Good right now on this last one. So the board over here, when you're talking about the senior leader, creates the succession plan. How much lead time do we need? What skill sets do we need? Is this an internal hire or external hire? And on the leader side, the senior leader has to create a transition plan. When will I be leaving? What information do I know that needs to be documented? How do we typically do things around here? When do we have staff meetings? When do we do performance reviews? That type of detail. When I leave, I call it the CEO cookbook. When I leave, I've documented what we do, where to find it, how we do things around here. So you don't leave a, a void. So when you continue this and sharing these leaders and resources, board members are the largest ambassador group you have by far. They're the largest ambassador group you have. They're out in the community. They're usually respected, known business leaders. They're out there and they're communicating your mission and your impact to the community on a regular basis. Invite them to activities, invite them to speak at an event. They're your biggest asset. And that level of ambassadorship actually draws more people to your organization. They didn't know about you. Now they know about you. They went to your fundraising event. Make sure they know how to be a good ambassador. And next one, make sure participation by your board in community awareness events. Most people wanna invite their board to a fundraiser. And yes, that's one of their roles and responsibilities to participate in fundraising. But if you have other events, invite them to participate. And then, golly, if you have the time and you have the money for it, make sure they're wearing a branded T-shirt or a branded shirt of some kind, or they have a name tag that says your organization on it. Set them up well to be ambassadors and out there. And that last one's so powerful. They make connections for you in the community. They make connections to organizations that might want to be sponsors for you. They make connections to organizations you might want to partner with because they, they're connected to the community. They make connections to people who might want to be on your, your board or might want to serve on one of your committees. That is a huge role. That is a huge role. They make awareness of your organization and they bring people to your organization. On the other side of this, what is the CEO, executive director leading that staff do? They're the biggest organizational ambassador out there. I used to, when I was the CEO for Girl Scouts, I wore green every single day. Green is the Girl Scout color. I wore it every single day. I wore a name tag every single day that said, you know, who I was and what organization I was with. I, I was, 
out there going to networking events, going to luncheons. I'm just out there telling the story. To me, that's the best part of being the leader. You get to go out there and tell the story. And then the next one, make sure you participate in those community awareness events. It could be a collaborative thing. It could be a networking thing. It could be a chamber presentation. Just make sure you're out there. Surprisingly enough, there are a lot of leaders out there who are quiet people. You, you would think they're going to be people who can work a room easily, but they're quiet. And it's hard for, for a lot of senior leaders who are thinkers to go out there and do this. But that's one of your jobs to be an ambassador. And then you make connections for the organization as well. Who do I know? Who can I invite? Who do I talk to? This one, the last one on the leadership side, this is something that become a big deal now in the nonprofit world, develop and oversee community partnerships. When you're going after a grant, one of the first questions you'll get now is who are your community partners and how do you partner with them? Because a lot of granting organizations want to see a network, a collaborative, a collaborative effort. So one of your big roles as the senior leader is they may, my, my board member may make a connection to me. It's my job to follow up on it. I need to develop that relationship and build a collaborative workspace. All right. Are there any questions on this? I, I do feel like I'm going a little too fast today. I didn't want to leave out any great information for Nika. I feel like I'm going a little too fast. There is a question from Blossom. She asked, how would you help the executive director CEOs here to help educate their boards about the care and keeping? So one of the, the best tips I learned was actually from Todd Grandy, who was the chair of the Boys and Girls Club for a really long time. And what he had learned this from somebody else. He was the board chair. And once a week, Monday, he had a 10 minute call with the CEO. And he only asked three questions and he did it every single week. What's going well? What's not going well? And how can I help you? And those three questions made sure that he as the board chair knew how the CEO was doing as an employee. And those questions also led to how's the organization doing and how can I help you? Because board members want to help you. They need to help you within their lane. But if they don't know, you could use their help. How will they, you know, they can't help you. But I thought that was one of the best tools I've ever heard of. Understand that this is a person. It's an organizational leader, but it's a person. And it's a person who needs support and needs emotional support, not just business support. It's a big job, right, Liberty? It's a big job leading a, an organization, starting it from scratch. It's a big job. Add to that. So Todd shared that same thing with me probably four or five years ago. And so I've done it with um, someone on my board. It hasn't always been the board president um, for like every Monday, you know, that's a working Monday for the last like four or five years. It's, it's, it's helpful. I really yeah. Enjoy it. Yeah. So I'm not sure if that answered the question. But to me, that's a best practice about how do you, how do you ensure the care and keeping of the CEO? And the other big one is make sure you give feedback, formal feedback, and informal feedback from the board. People want to know how they're doing and they want to know when they're doing something that could be better. Like well, one of my favorite quotes was, feedback is a gift, even when you're afraid to open the package. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I would add a couple of things to that. If you have a long-term um, CEO or executive director, I think it's really important for the board to really look at some quality downtime giving them mm. that, whether it's a sabbatical or an extended vacation where they really can turn it off and you take things from them. I think that's a really important piece because there's a lot of nonprofit leaders who say they're on vacation, but they're still working every day. Um, Blossom is a great example today. <laughs> <laughs> but and the other thing that uh, that I think is, is equally important is just recognizing um, their development as a yes. leader and finding and supporting, you know, it, it not say, not letting them say, oh, we don't have that money in the budget. If there's a place for their development, they're constantly looking for ways to empower the staff and the board's job is to empower and train the director to be better at what they do as well. So I think that's a powerful point, Kimbra. So the CEO needs professional development as well. So I need access to, to best practices in the community. 
trade books, training sessions. I need access to professional development and I also need skill development. So part of taking care of the CEO is making sure they get the type of support they need to become even more effective. You're absolutely right. It should be a placeholder in the budget. It should be under operations or employee engagement that we make sure we secure funds and provide access to professional and skill development. And when uh, people have this, this strange concept that nonprofits can't spend money on things that aren't directly tied to the mission, well, having effective leadership is directly tied to the mission. So have a placeholder in there for the care and keeping of the CEO for professional development. I don't know how you could ever actually get most CEOs to not work on their vacation, but it's a great idea. <laughs> Anybody else want to weigh in on that one? Because that's a fabulous question. What is, how do you do best practice in care and keeping of the CEO? Is, at least for me, like I think it is part of caring for the CEO. Doing the Liberty, can you bring your microphone down? I was, yeah, just saying that um, everything that we've you've just talked about in this little bit um, is a part of the care of the CEO. I think not feeling alone in carrying the vision, and knowing that other people are helping with the strategic planning and ensuring that, that we have funds to pay staff and all of that. Yeah. It's part of the care, especially someone like me that when I, you know, care so much about the work, it is encouraging when other people, I see that same level of care from them and like um, excitement about being a part of the organization. You know, um, Liberty, one thing I think boards forget is that even though you're in that the senior leaders in the position because their hearts in it and they're you know this is this isn't just a job to them this is like life's work for them that they're also employees and I say you know, professional development skill based employee uh, skill training but the other one is are, are on a regular basis annually consider compensation consider the compensation of the the senior leader. So if inflation is going at 70% and you're giving a COLA of 2%, that's a problem. <laughs> you know, because I, I don't know a single nonprofit leader who's, who's overpaid, not one. In fact, somebody asked me uh, what, what, what was the mean salary, the average salary of a, a leader of a nonprofit in the state of Idaho. And it's actually about $65,000. You know, if, you're, if you have a family and you have a mortgage and you have a car payment, and you're paying off college debt, that's not a whole lot of money left at the end of the month. Like my husband, I used to say, there's too much month, too much month left at the end of the money. So one of those ongoing conversations just means on a regular basis, evaluate the compensation. And if there's a way to give somebody a small bonus or a small bump, do it, do it. Yeah, any other great ideas? Okay, so going back to this one, the ambassador role. I, I've, I have found that most board members don't see themselves in this role. They don't see themselves as going out and telling the story. So what I did in Girl Scouts is I gave them all business cards and on the front it said board member, Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. And on the back, it had five powerful impact statements of Girl Scouts. 98% more likely to go on and complete a college degree, 94% more likely to never try illicit drugs. And I just put it on the back of a card for them. So when they, so there's some, they can turn around and go, hi, I'm on the board of Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. And if you're wondering what we do, you know, what we do is we create leadership opportunities and training for girls. And here's our impact. Here's what happens when your girl stays in Girl Scouts for a couple of years. Just give them the message. Give them some succinct messaging. Liberty, do you have like um, a, a couple message statements that your boards get for that elevator speech or I'm sitting at a table networking? Do you have something like that for them? We've been working on some. Um, so we, we got kind of one 
tagline established last year, but I don't have it like in a print or something they could hand out. Okay. That would, that would help your, your board members. Here's like three impact statements for what we do, or here's what we do in a, in a, in a nutshell and why we do it. That would be very helpful. I'm working with an organization right now that doesn't have that. They don't have their unique selling point. They don't have succinct messaging for the board members. So it's really hard for their board members to go out and tell the story. Very hard. And like those business cards, they would pass out to people with those impact statements on it or would, yeah. is it just like a tool? Okay. No. So I, I, I'm a big fan of business cards. I write down who the person, wh where I met the person, what day it was and little context. So the board members got that. I'm a board member, Girl Scouts of Silver Sage. Here's the tagline. Here's the website. And on the back was five impact statements on the back. Help them be ambassadors for you because most of them want to be. They just don't know how. And here's one I'm, I'm working on right now. I, I just did some work with a, a tiny little organization out of state last weekend. And they don't have a lot of visibility in the community. They really don't. You know, it was one of those problems where you're doing good work and nobody knows you're here. So who could your board member invite to an event, to a fundraiser? Who could they invite? Who could they build a connection to for you? You're busy working on in the business every day. Let them help you make connections. It could even be a brainstorming session at a, at a board meeting. I'm a big fan of uh, board agendas that has 10 minutes plugged in for generative conversation. You got through the business of the day. You have 10 minutes at the end to go, what else could we talk about today? How else could we help the organization? And the, the staff members can say, well, we really need somebody who can give us access to this skill set or who knows someone who works for this company so we can go talk to them. Just a generative conversation. How can you help us get better connected? So this one, as I said, this is the biggest meat of it. Ensure leadership and resources. Ensure upkeep of property and equipment. That's their job to ensure that it's happening, not necessarily to do the work. Make sure you're doing that. Are you tracking depreciation? Are, are we doing walkthroughs of our property. Make sure that that is a placeholder for the staff tied to a strategy. And then the other side, the CEO is the one who supervises the actual activity. So has anybody here got like properties or equipment you need to take care of for your organization? Yeah. Oh, you do. That's right. Cause you have houses, right? So if I was the, if I was on your board, Liberty, on this side of this equation, ensure leadership and resources, it would be like a, a property committee that looks helps you develop a long-term property plan. When will we, we need to replace the roof? When do we need to replace the HVAC? When do we need to replace the, the, the water heater? You know, when do we need to upgrade the landscaping? And that would be a board level committee with staff members participating. I, I've been very fortunate to work in organizations where we had a lot of property and have very effective board committees. And that's not my lane. You know, I'm not in I'm not in the property management realm. So being able to use them to brainstorm how to do this and then we go out and execute it was very, very useful. And the next one, this one's people always think fiduciary needs money. So here's the money one. Now we're going to talk about money, oversee budget planning and implementation. And there's specific things a board should be able to give you guidance on when your organization starts developing next year's budget or an even longer term multi-year budget. There's a couple of things they need to give you written guidance on. Are there any constraints or restraints? So I mentioned one, a policy that says the executive director or CEO can't spend more than a specified amount without board knowledge and approval of it. That's that's a very common one. A another, another thing they might say is the, the budget needs to have a two to three year look. Most organizations do a one-year look. They might say, um, you need to actually give me a two to three-year look. Uh, next one is investments. Uh, nonprofits need to make a profit. That's how this works. You just don't give it out to, to shareholders when it's over. You reinvest it in the company. You reinvest it in operations. But does your organization have the ability to create an investment account that can just, uh, let's make money on money? And then do you have an investment account and do they... This one's important. If you have an investment account, is there an important 
element to this that is make sure we are operating in accordance with our values. Do we have a need for social, uh, is it called somebody help me here, social awareness investing or socially, something like that. So I, I'll give an example. I was in a, a nonprofit that had an investment portfolio and I realized part of our investment portfolio was in tobacco. Well, that was not something that was related to our mission. It wasn't a message we wanted to send because we were a children's based organization. So the conversation with the investment committee, we created an investment committee is which funds out there allow for socially aware investing, which ones. And then they put in writing, here are certain things that our investments will not touch. And it was alcohol. Um, hate to have to say this out loud because there are people who invest in this, pornography <laughs> and tobacco. But it was very helpful for me. And capital expenses, let's say you do have to replace a roof on your on your house and that's a $30,000 investment. Somebody says, okay, we have to earmark funds a couple years in advance for when that's gonna happen. So in, in fiscal year 26, we've set aside funds for large capital investments. And the last one is what are the budget requirements? And those could be pretty simple. Must be a multi-year budget, must operate in the black by the end of year two if you're operating in the red right now. Some just very specific things, must have a cash flow forecast, must produce a monthly P&L. Those are very specific things that you should get guidance on when you're building a budget. And then the, the staff working with whoever your financial expert is, works with the board to make sure that whatever we're de developing meets those requirements, meets that guidance. Are there any questions or any great insights on this one? Because I'm not a finance person and one of you might be. Um, Blossom said it's social impact investing is the great. term. She also yeah. asked, do you have a calendar with annual things that board of directors should be reviewing or evaluating based on your, your list of board responsibilities here? I could actually just map them out and then put together a very simple calendar. Usually I, I ask that, I asked when this is why that I think next week is setting board level plans. The board level plan is when are we going to do these things? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you plug it in under each one of these three large areas of responsibility. You plug in when we're going to review the conflict of interest statement, the whistleblower policy, the document retention destruction, when we're going to review the draft budget, when we're going to review your property maintenance plan. It's plugged into those work areas. And then I ask the board to hold themselves accountable. It's in quarter one, what the activity and when it's going to be done. I know in my circumstance as a director, um, it really fell to me to create that calendar. But then I partnered with the board chair to make sure that we brought it forward. When I when we collaborated on the agenda, that was always one of our checkpoints. Let's go look at the fiscal responsibilities calendar and see what we need to talk about this time. Even though it's driven by the board chair, a lot of times it falls to the, the CEO ED to, to really bring it forward. Yes, because you're down in the middle of it day to day. Mm -hmm. So you, you already counted your activities and you know which activities they do that are complementary to yours. So let's make sure it's on your calendar. What's your board level work plan? What is it? Were you gonna say something, Bethany? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. All right. So I think this is the last section for this, because I, as I said, ensure leadership and resources is the biggest work area for a board. And then policy development for risk mitigation. So here, here's an example. Um, Bishop Kelly has, it's called a board of governance instead of a board of directors. And they are in writing in their bylaws, a policy creation board. That's what their bylaws say. So then we had a, a really healthy conversation about, well, what policies do you have that address risk? And it might be, do we adhere to the state ratio of, of adult to children, you know, one to 15 for high school students? You know, do we have policies that say, here's the type of risk we might encounter based on what we do, what our purpose and mission is and how we execute it. Another policy for risk mitigation might be make sure we have um, insurance for our properties. We're adequately insured for our, for our properties. Uh, almost all boards have directors and officers insurance, right? So that's risk mitigation. Policy requirement would be we annually renew our um, our board of directors. Gee whiz, I just lost the term in English. Uh, insurance. 
<laughs> so there's all these little things when you step back and you go, what are the risks, especially for like someone like you, Liberty, because you're working with young people who have challenges. Are there certain things that the board knows we need to pay, be paying attention to? And because you, you run a house, you know, you run a place where people live, it would be looking down at that micro level. If something happens on our property, could we be sued? If someone comes to visit them or one of our, our residents gets injured, do we have adequate insurance for that? If we have vehicles, do we have adequate insurance for the vehicles we're using? It sounds like minutia, but having it in writing and reviewing it on a regular basis really does mitigate your risk. What are some other guys, what are some other ideas of, or examples of policies you've used because they did address risk? We ended up making sure that we created a um, conflict conflict resolution path, and mm -hmm. we actually implemented a board liaison for the staff because you know the, the, it is the CEO director who is in direct contact with and responsible for the staff. But occasionally something might come up that they're just not comfortable talking to their director about. So we had a board liaison position. Then that oh. liaison was connected to the director. It would not take things independently to that staff person, but was responsible to be the mitigator between the staff. And, and so that was that was a, a really huge piece for us. That, I've, I've never heard that before, but I've had an experience where I, where I had a board that absolutely did not like one of my employees. Mm -hmm. And she, she was effective. She got her work done, but they just flat out didn't like her. So that would at, at that point it would have been helpful to have some kind of some kind of liaison mm -hmm. because because it just became hostile and from my perspective she worked hard she did her job but there was a personality thing that was a conflict yeah yeah and that's just people that pathway that you everybody can check and see did we do this did we do this did we do the other before it goes into any kind of remedial tool you know um, also what you're talking about. Uh, is um, I call it a, a chain of communication. So the board's supposed to work directly with the CEO, but what if the staff is having tremendous difficulties with the CEO that can't be resolved? There needs to be a, a, a way for people to talk to the board. When we, when we can't get resolution on our side, we need to work with you to get resolution. And that would be a, a chain of communication policy. Oh, another one that I learned <laughs> the hard way was have a policy for uh, making sure board members aren't posting company business on social media. You know, that's part of that duty of care, duty of obedience. You know, what, what happens in the office stays in the office, please. <laughs> yeah. And the last one, I'm going to touch on the, the fund development activities. This is the number one fear of most board members, fundraising. That is the number one fear. So they tend to not step into that lane. And there's lots and lots of easy ways to step into the lane. And I, I give a presentation on 10 easy ways to participate in fundraising, but it is helpful to have a policy for board members that says, even like a give or get policy, I will, I will commit myself financially to giving or getting for the organization. That is a good policy to have. You, you need, it is part of your role. You need to step into it in a meaningful way. Or like a, uh, a board organizational annual commitment statement that says, I will participate in at least three fundraising state activities, that level of accountability. Anybody else have any good ideas about that one? How to get board members to participate in fund development? We had some, I know Partners for Good, our board in our annual board retreat, we had some very specific training on how to do fundraising as a board member. So even professional development to help equip and empower them to feel a little bit more confident for asking for money is sometimes yeah. uncomfortable for us. And that was very beneficial. Yeah. I guess you could roll that under care and keeping of the board, right? Make sure they get professional development and training as well. Okay. So we went through a lot of information and when you look at it, they have similar responsibilities based on fiduciary responsibilities, but how those responsibilities are carried out are different. And when people understand that here, here's your lane and here's my lane, 
and please stay in your lane so we can both be effective. It can be very useful in helping a board actually become the best version of themselves. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know what specific activities are. I give myself feedback. I want to be good at this job. It's a job. It's just a non-paid job. It is a job, and I want to be good at it. And the, the roles are definitely mutually supportive. Did I miss anything that you guys go, well, here's one thing I know boards are responsible for, and this is how it looks on the staff side? I did have a question about working boards. So sometimes organizations are small that there's board members who are also actively involved in the day-to-day -day operations. Do you have recommendations or advice of how those things could happen at the same time, but still keep some of that those distinct roles and responsibilities separated, even if there's some crossover in, in the individuals? My first response is always make sure working boards are temporary arrangements. You are always working towards having a, a board that is truly a governing board, not an in the middle of day-to-day -day affairs. Always work towards that. Have that part of by the end of this fiscal year, we will have sufficient staff to conduct the day-to-day -day work. And then I, there's, I'm not sure, I, I would be looking out to uh, Blossom and Kimbra and even you, Bethany, like once you understand what the lanes are, how do you help people say, this is a temporary relationship here. You're, you're temporarily working with the staff and then you move back over here. That, that direct work thing is now over. Please shift back here. Anybody have ideas on that one? I know when Blossom and I work a lot in the terms of a committee. And so a committee yep. has a very specific cadence and they'll come on with a very specific task. And once that's wrapped up, then you know, you're free to move about the the rest of the the board responsibility chart. But committees tend to committees. focus people in for periods of time. Yeah. And uh, most board bylaws will actually say that they have the ability to have temporary and permanent committees. And to me, that's where a lot of the, the work actually gets done. So committees it, it exist to do that thinking and that research and to bring recommendations forward to the board. But let develop a committee, invite community members who have skill in this to be on that committee and help you do the hard work. Mm -hmm. And then that committees, I said committees are a great way to date potential board members. So if you've been on a committee for a while and you're effective, you enjoy it, you've gotten to understand the organization, you might transition very naturally into a board member. So committees. And you can have as many committees as the board approves, right? Oh, here's the one. I, I did have this experience in Idaho, um, committees that ste kept stepping over to do board level work. So I always recommend you have a committee charter that says what is the purpose of this committee and what are the five or six activities of the committee and be very, very clear. Because you don't want the board, you don't want committees telling staff members what to do and committees don't tell board members what to do. Committees exist to give recommendations. That's why they exist. So that's a great point, Kimbra. Okay. All right, so I got to finish with a, with a terrible pun. So we just went through the purpose of both the board and the, the, the executive director. What are, what are additional questions or comments? And everything I talked about today, I have turned into handouts and given to boards before. I think it's a useful tool that when you do board onboarding, you go through those respective roles and responsibilities and what they look like. And at board retreats, you go through them once again. What is our what is our lane and what is the lane of the staff? Just it, you can't emphasize those one enough. Laureen, I think you're doing a fantastic job of laying out this concept and these, these topics. I am personally going to be taking this forward to a couple of boards to encourage them to make this series part of the onboarding process. So you know oh. you have you go through step one or the first video and then come back and discuss it in terms of that particular organization, go through step two, come back and discuss it. I think it's going to make for some very thorough onboarding. And it's it's such a great resource. Thanks for doing this. Oh, you're very welcome. And, and I loved leveraging off Blossom's first presentation. What, what does fiduciary responsibility mean? Now let's move it forward and discuss it again in a different context. Now let's move it forward and discuss it again. 
So that's why you're gonna see me go back, circle back all the time. The three work areas of a board can easily align to the three work areas of the senior leader. And it's just once, once you pe help people understand that, what they do is oversight of all of these things and give guidance and you execute all of these things. Who does what? Yeah. Well, I, I'm glad this is happening because there are so few boards that get this kind of training and understanding. And what happens when you're a board member and you don't get good on boarding, you don't understand your role is you usually, there's, there's two things, the worst case scenario, you do very little and nobody gets to use your gifts and talents in a meaningful way, or you overreach. And when you overreach into the, the staff, you cause confusion. I'm gonna go ahead and launch our final poll. Okay. And um, do our, our my little spiel, And but if there's other questions or discussion, um, we'll hang around for a couple minutes to do so. So thank you for joining us today. The Nonprofit Success Lab is brought to you by Idaho Partners for Goods. Social Enterprise Thrive Together Consulting. Thrive Together provides three buckets of consulting services, operations, leadership, and strategy. The Thrive Together Consulting services are designed with your team to enhance efficiency, streamline processes, and optimize your resource allocation. We tailor strategies with team members from across the organization to ensure your operations align with your overall goals. Um, when your business takes time to build strategies that work, then you can spend more time in the business and less time fighting fires. And a percentage of all of our consulting fees help funds the work of IDO Partners for Good with nonprofits. Next up in our Nonprofit Success Lab series is part three of Maureen's four-part series. Um, we continue next Thursday, March 7th, and the focus is on setting board level plans and goals. Um, if you benefited from today's workshop, please help us spread the word and invite other leaders, especially those who sit on boards. Thank you, Maureen. All right, thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. <laughs>